Hello everyone, uh, my name is Steven Weigel and I'm a composer and a performer who uses keyboards, guitars, the voice, woodwinds, and computers to play music in various microtonal tuning systems. My presentation today is about the idea of comparing tuning systems intervals against each other and what that might mean for how we hear such pieces. I also want to provide a slightly more rigorous and technical definition of Zen harmonic than I have given in the past. My hope is that the ideas in this presentation can apply to any music that uses discrete pitches that are intervallically and perceptually unambiguous, like they would be in a standard undergraduate music theory class. So my presentation today is called Zen Harmonics, Moderation, and Tonality. I sort of maintain that moderation and tonality are very helpful elements to have in a Zen Harmonic environment. Now let's talk about the difference between the words microtonal versus Zen Harmonic briefly. Um, the word microtonal is now being used to describe tuning systems that aren't tuned in 12 tone equal temperament, or 12 equal divisions of the octave, or 12 EDO, as you may have heard it called. It also has the connotation of small steps, although that doesn't really have to be in play at all. Uh, the word Zen harmonic was coined by Ivor Derek to describe music that doesn't sound like it's in 12 EDO. So, microtonal, music that doesn't use 12. EDO, and, and Zen harmonic is music that sounds like it's not in 12 EDO. So that's really important. You could say that the word microtonal describes what something is conceptually, while the word Zen harmonic describes how we perceive it. And thus the word Zen harmonic was needed because what we perceive is often different than what is happening in reality. So the word microtonal simply tells us about the tool we're using, while the word Zen harmonic may describe the affect and or how our ears interpret things. Defining Zen harmonic as not sounding like 12 EDO has a few problems with it, though. Here's why. Well, there are situations in which one could find 12 Zen harmonic. Um, this is a viewpoint that genuinely surprised me at first when I got into the microtonal community. Um, sometimes people who would immerse themselves in another tuning system, such as 22 EDO, and then go back to 12 EDO, they return to find 12 Zen harmonic again. Now, this would certainly cause the definition of Zen harmonics to break down, if true, wouldn't it? Or maybe just it's really pliable. Couldn't any tuning system be Zen harmonic under this line of thinking? Yes, and it works with the slightly modified definition that I'm about to propose here. Um, another less surprising but equally important point is that defining Zen harmonics as not sounding like 12 EDO is culturally Eurocentric. Both of these views suggest that it's possible for 12 EDO to be Zenharmonic, and thus that we can't simply define Zenharmonic as not sounding like 12 EDO. We just have to go a little bit deeper. So, the way to remedy these two points is to understand that for any tuning system to be Zenharmonic, it simply has to be compared to another tuning system, not understood in isolation. I don't mean that the listener is always consciously making this comparison, or listening for intervals, but I do mean that the listener is constantly relating everything they hear to what they've heard in the past. So I prefer to think of the definition of Zen harmonic not always as tunings that are intervallically different from 12 EDO, but as sounding intervallically different from whichever tuning one is used to hearing, or a standard tuning. And really that even means sounding like it contains extremely unfamiliar intervals. So obviously, if you've never heard of intervals before, this might not really make sense, but for those of us who know what intervals are, th this I think is a better definition because it not only addresses the fuzz fuzzy logic kind of between chromatic and zenharmonic phenomena, but it also gets rid of defining ourselves antagonistically uh, against equal temperament. So let's talk about examples of 12 tone equal temperament being zenharmonic. Um, there are a few, but the best one comes from Sevish, and you might know him already because we're using his scale workshop for the 22 EDO Solfege sessions, at least at Parnu 2021. So, for us to be hearing unfamiliar intervals, there have to be familiar intervals. For us to hear intervals as out of their normal slots, we somehow have to be comparing to a tuning system where the notes sound in the slots. Um, the familiar tuning system just happens to be 12 EDO for many of us, but it doesn't have to be. It could probably be any tuning system that's small enough to still have somewhat of an individual character, so a tuning system that doesn't saturate too much perceivable pitch space. Uh, it's very much like a language in that way, where we select a small number of things that are available, and we kind of have like a starter pack for things to make more sense. 
For much of the time, it will make sense for us to talk about the word Zen harmonic as though it means not sounding like it's in 12 EDO, although we can get more precise if we want. Like, for example, the phrase 14 EDO is Zen harmonic could be understood as saying unfamiliar tuning system X, which happens to be 14 EDO, sounds noticeably different than familiar tuning system Y, which happens to be 12 EDO. I'm going to call the unfamiliar tuning system, in a comparison, the Zen harmonic tuning system, and I will call the normal tuning system, or the one that the person is theoretically used to, the standard tuning system. So there's a Zen harmonic tuning and a standard tuning being compared against each other. Okay, so the act of getting used to intervals in a microtonal song and then hearing it in 12 can inspire this feeling, but there are kind of mixed reviews. Over on Sevish's channel, he has a few versions of uh, songs of his that have been retuned to 12 EDO. And sometimes this can kind of get by your ear and you cannot notice it. And sometimes it, it really ruins the song, which uh, I think is pretty interesting. Uh, and some people in the comments really don't like the 12 EDO versions because they hear the original versions as being in the slots since they know what the song is like. But then there are some people who haven't really trained in microtones yet, maybe, um, not really sure, who say, ah, oh, the 12 EDO version sounds so much better. It's like a breath of fresh air. Depends on the song and how things line up, right? Sometimes the logic of how just the notes stack up and all of that might not really work. Some might hear it as corrected from where it was, and some may hear it as too different from the original to pass. Um, I'm sometimes in the latter category and sometimes in the former. So yeah, those relationships might change, and it's one of the more important factors. Uh, my analysis sort of attempts to explain these differences. Um, but I'm sort of scratching at the surface level in this presentation because I'm very interested in trying to figure out how to move this forward effectively. So I want to share one of these examples with you today because I think it will lead into my next point really fantastically. Here's uh, a version of the Imperial March in 17 tone equal temperament that the Mercury Tree played. So I'm going to play these two clips for you and I want you to tell me which one you think is more Zen harmonic. So there's that first clip. Here's the second clip. So there's a B. So I think the second one is more Zen harmonic, right? We can all agree about that because the first one uses the straight up melody rendered in 17 tones diatonic scale, which relatively has all the same intervallic sizes, even though they're stretched and shrunk a bit to match 17 EDO's intonation. And then the other one uses chords that are unique to 17 EDO, including some uh, things that sound like the 11th or 13th harmonic or 11th harmonic and a 13 limit interval that's near it. Um, and stuff like that. So really, uh, whether something is Zen harmonic or not depends on how you use a tuning, and that matters a lot more than the tuning itself, although the tuning itself really does matter. I mean, probably the feeling of intervals being in the wrong intervallic slot kind of separates unfamiliar Zen harmonic intervals from simple unfamiliar chromatic intervals uh, that we would be used to from a standard tuning. So. Let's go ahead and look at our next example. When most people refer to a tuning as Zen harmonic, they assume that the music will have moderate parameters and that the listeners are unfamiliar with many of the intervals. And this is true for most kinds of music 
or for most kinds of music that the average person would consider music. So that's why it's kind of important for the mechanism to work. Um, having, having moderate parameters, like, you know, the piece should have a discernible tempo, the pitches should be discrete, things like you would see in an undergrad music theory example. That's kind of what people assume about the situation when they talk about whether a tuning is in harmonic or not. And they probably assume you're using most of the scale too, but you don't have to. Um, okay, so here's an experiment for you. Um, I have two clips here, and each of them is in a tuning system, uh, clip A and clip B, and I want you to guess what tuning system each one is in and which one is more enharmonic. All right, and here's clip B. Okay, great. So those are those clips there. So maybe you thought that one was more as harmonic than the other. Maybe one melody was more repetitive than the other. Okay, so it turns out both clips use a father eight scale in 13 tone equal temperament. So the intervallic sequence for that two, two, one, two, two, one, two, one. Um, that's kind of like, you can think of do, re, mi, fa, so, la. And then by the time you get to la, it's a minor sixth. So then you would go uh, la, ti, do from that. Like there'd be a half step there. So that's sort of what, what Father 8 does. It's, it kind of scrunches that down a bit. So then here's the pitch classes that would be used. 0, 2, 4. Between 4 and 5, there's a 1. 5, 7, 9. And then between 9 and 10, there's also 1. And then 10 and 12. So my hope is that A sounded less zenharmonic and that B sounded more zenharmonic. Let's explore why. So A uses stepwise motion and holds static notes to move on so that the listener is making few comparisons between possible intervals. Basically, the nearer intervals are to each other in a melody, the more you will make comparisons. And then you'll also be comparing to some kind of tonal center, which doesn't have to use any of the scales that you're used to, but it is always referring back to something, uh, unless you're in like atonal music. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's the situation for A. And then B uses different leaps throughout the octave with different kinds of constructs warped from where they are in 12 EDO. So this forces us to make more comparisons. And it's also a sequence, right? So it's like the melody in B starts like... And then it's like that first chunk has repeated in the second chunk, but we've just shifted down a father eight scale degree, shifted down again, and then there are arpeggiations of triads which don't line up in 12. So we'll get to that. So here is the music for our examples. These are notated as a subset of 26 tone equal temperament and it's native fifth. You can almost see that example A there looks really, really simple and it gets us to sort of focus on each one of its little miniature tonal centers in the bar, like a center of F sharp, F sharp, and then B flat, and then C. Um, in fact, you can almost turn it into a five note pentascale like do, re, mi, fa, so, but the so is just so flat and squashed that it's actually a tritone away from the F sharp. And then example B is just purely in father eight and analogizing it in 12 EDO is really hard, but we're going to try anyway. Um, and I've got that nice little circle down there for you showing you the father eight geometry. I'll try to do this whenever I present a simple scale in an equal temperament. Okay. Let's talk about some ways that music can be zenharmonic, and then what I'm interested in talking about for the very limited and early scope of this analysis. So, um, we're talking about how music can be zenharmonic in terms of discrete intervals. So, that's sort of what we're looking at. So, uh, intervals can be zenharmonic over time in a non-adjacent way by drifting structurally. So, in regular temperament theory, of course, there are comma pumps, uh, which have to do with how you can round intervals and add them up, accumulate their small differences over time 
to end up at a different place than you normally would in the standard tuning from where you started. So if that happens and it causes the pitch to continue to change, either in a modulatory way or in a drifting, uh, shifted way where, you know, the pitch is just going up and up, or even in a sequenced way where the pitch is just going up bit by bit, that is, I call that a structural drift different tonic, where the intended tonic keeps changing. Um, and then structural drift same tonic would be you have a situation where intervals add up to something different than where they would in the standard tuning, but they go back to the same tonic. Um, so I think structural drift same tonic is really effective. Um, and so is a different tonic. They, they both are. Um, and they're also on a continuum with each other, as are these sort of uh, local ideas. So we have xenharmonics over time that isn't heard immediately, but is registered on the level of a progression. And then we have uh, local ways music can be xenharmonic, adjacent or almost adjacent intervals, so intervals that are right next to each other. So there are intervals that are in slot, uh, playing with the just noticeable difference. I used to call that tugging, but this is a more technical term. Um, this happens when an interval is almost right where it should be, but really it's wavering around a bit or it's slightly low or high in such a way that you know it's detuned, but you can't quite put your finger on whether it's sharp or flat. And sometimes this can get into the range of being an in-slot interval, flat or sharp. So those two ranges often play with each other and they're very similar. Now, being in slot, flat, or sharp in uh, a more extreme way can also be perceived as being out of tune, and perhaps that could even be a third category. Something like a note and then a nota diesis away, which has that little tiny crunch that's not exactly associated with a semitone, but something smaller that you can notice, or maybe even a little bit smaller than that. And then, of course, the third sort of local category is an interval that's out of slot. Um, in fact, the intervals that are most out of slot for any given equal temperament are two times the equal temperament. So quarter tones are the most out of slot from 12 tone equal tempered intervals in a local sense. So that's how I, I kind of refer to these over time. And a lot of this has to do with my own personal methodology and isn't really uh, something that's meant to be an overview of the field. I don't even really know what that would be, but anyway, that's there. So tempo can change how adjacently we perceive intervals in time and is thus very important. Uh, we get used to things more quickly if the progression is highly repetitive or if the progression makes less comparisons between intervals. Now, the reason I'm interested in talking about structural drift, same tonic here, uh, is because I use it in my own music to intentionally create xenharmonic twists. Uh, and I'll also talk about it a little bit in other people's music as well. So using structural drift to compare tunings is something that can work with harmony and or melody. I tend to focus on one at a time because then it's easier to break down that simple element by translating it into the other tuning. Um, but it's possible to look at really, really xenharmonic things in many, many different ways and come up with many interpretations. So probably more xenharmonic structural drifts have more interpretations that go along with them, but not necessarily. They can also have less, and we'll talk about that. The subjectivity of how one perceives intervals is important, and I have not found a rigorous way to account for it. Perhaps some kind of survey could be given to a listener before they were taking his enharmonic test so that we could figure out sort of what their ears do. That would be sort of interesting, like a little uh, subjective Myers-Briggs as to how you hear intervals. Um, we write a passage out in the xenharmonic tuning and then compare it to how we would write it in the standard tuning, which as you remember, does not have to be 12 EDO, but usually is. Uh, we can also write out several interpretations in the standard tuning. If the analogous version in standard tuning only has one good interpretation, it's probably not very xenharmonic via the notion of structural drift, but may definitely be xenharmonic in other ways. I'd say there's some progressions that only have one interpretation in 12 EDO that um, aren't xenharmonic at all, and some actually um, can be very xenharmonic but uh, have other uh, sort of interesting approximations associated with them. So. The two approaches I like to think about are taking a, a referential approach that goes back to the tonic and a referential approach that goes back to whatever uh, note or interval happened right before the note that you're on. So when you think about translating something into 12 EDO, you're really combining these two approaches. Since this is about comparing intervals, the best way to proceed is to compare the xenharmonic progression to the standard progression in two main ways. Um, in the adjacent way of comparing, you just compare everything as it's going, like in time. So you compare each new note or chord to the previous one in terms of the standard tuning. 
And then for a tonic-based referential approach, you would compare each new note or chord to the perceived pitch center in terms of the standard tuning. Uh, so if there's a conflict between how the notes are perceived compared to the tonic and how the notes are perceived compared to how adjacent intervals add them up, then theoretically you have something that exhibits structural drift, same tonic. Um, and comma pump progressions often exploit this. Um, so I'm sure that almost all of the examples I provide uh, would have more specific commatic interpretations if I had bothered to include J.I. Um, so if this were to be done rigorously, one would compare each new note or chord to every previous note or chord, including tonic. But that might be cumbersome and not as representative of how people hear. So I didn't do that here. It's like how if you have any intervals in a scale and you play them, any interval in the scale can potentially be compared to any other interval, right? Um, but the way you play a melody means that only certain comparisons will be made. So it's like you're choosing between comparisons. Now, there are some other methods we could employ. Notes or chords could be compared to secondary tonics. Um, notes or chords could be compared to structurally important and or emphasized notes. Uh, a ranked comparison system based on how close in time intervals are to each other might help. Like, for example, if you were comparing intervals adjacently and you got to this note, maybe the note before it affects it the most, and the note that's second most before it affects it slightly less, and then third most before it slightly less than that, and things like that depending on structural importance. So I think there's some subjectivity involved in this analysis where I say, okay, like, I've decided that at these few points we have structurally important notes just because of the way we hear it. And I really haven't found a way to formalize how I make those sorts of decisions, but um, I have formalized most of it. So let's go ahead and talk about our 13-tone demos, structural drift, and then other examples. So uh, here's example A again. I'll just play it for you to remind you how it sounds. Okay, great. So that's our first clip. So what I'm going to do for these examples here, I'm not going to do them for the rest of them, but in 13 tone equal temperament, um, a minor second and a major second are almost the same as in 12. And then if you are comparing 12 tone intervals vis-a-vis -vis 13 tone intervals, you get uh, things that are rounded to the same categories, except in the middle of the octave, both 6 thirteenths of an octave and 7 thirteenths of an octave are closer to the tritone. But 7 thirteenths can sometimes count as a perfect fifth via adjacent interval tracking. So that'll cause some conflicts between tonic and adjacent. So uh, here's what we do. Um, I'll, I'll walk you through how we compare it uh, via a referential tonic method and adjacent method, and then you'll kind of see how it works. Okay, so for the tonic here, what we do is we start with the first note. We're going to say that the tonic is F sharp because it sounds like that's what it is when it repeats and it starts over. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go to the next note in the 13 tone example and we're going to say, okay, um, that note there is two, uh, two thirteenths of an octave up from the tonic. And analogously in 12, that's also two twelfths up. So this gets pretty easy in 13 because look, four thirteenths of an octave is closest to four twelfths of an octave. We just have to keep going until we get to the tritone Ah, see? So now we get to 5 thirteenths of an octave, and then, well, now we have a note in 13 tone equal temperament that's 7 thirteenths of an octave. You see that C right there above the B flat? So that's actually closest to the tritone in 12, which means that if we're comparing it to the tonic, we represent it as 6 twelfths of an octave. So that's why we have that 6 over the C there. And then... This next interval, 9 thirteenths of an octave is closest to 8 thirteenths. Now that we've crossed over the octave, it's just minus 1, right? So then we continue that representation. Okay, so this is how uh, it goes uh, if you compare it to the tonic. Here's how it sounds in 12 EDO this way. Wow, yeah. 
that really doesn't work with that top part there, does it? Because the intervals literally just don't fit into 12 space. We have to just take out that one little extra uh, minor second. Okay, now let's talk about how we would form the adjacent intervals. You can think of this entire 13 note figure as a squashed do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, and just take that and just squish it down. Um, so, of course, the 12 EDO version would just be a little bit bigger. So now when we compare those adjacent intervals, we get this. What we do is we start at the beginning and check this out. We've got uh, something going up by 2 thirteenths of an octave, which is analogous to 2 twelfths. So we go up by 2, we go up by 2 again, and look at this. It's basically all the same here. It's just squashed in 13, right? Now, when we go up to pitch class 5 there, We've gone up 1 13th of an octave, so that's analogous to 1 12th of an octave here. And then look at this. This is the important part. So um, here, where during the tonic comparison, we would normally have something that's compared to tritone away from F sharp. Here, we have something that goes up 2 13ths of an octave from our previous note in the adjacent version. So we say that it's 5 12ths of an octave plus another major second. So that's 7. Right? So, there you go. And now we get this pattern that is the stretched version of the 13 tone version. And then it repeats. Right? Okay, here, let's play the adjacent version. Great. So see, I was kind of hoping that example A would sound like that adjacent version and that you might not even really notice since it was just melodic. Okay, let's talk about example B. So example B has a lot more information and we're also in a weird mode. I picked um, this sort of mode here that starts, well, it would have a uh, one, two, two, one, two, two, one, two. So it starts with a one here on F sharp. So here, let me play it again for you, the pattern. Okay, now let me play the 12 EDO tonic version. Okay, so that really ruined it, right? Because there's that little top part where it has to smooth out the nice alternating like major seconds and minor second pattern that we get from the father eight scale. And so a similar thing happens. Uh, let's hear the adjacent version. Okay, so that version probably sounded way, way more wonky and out of key, but maybe some of the intervals made more sense. You can see that with our adjacent version here, the actual intervals from note to note are the same. So it causes very significant pitch drift uh, to go down. And then on our last measure, where we have arpeggiated figures, we have something interesting going on. So check out measure 4 in 13 Tet. Our, our, our uh, arpeggiation uses A flat, C double sharp, and E. So that's uh, up 5 and up 3, right? So 5 plus 3 is 8. And then you go right back down to, uh, you know, it's, it's perfect fifth. So we're kind of approximating a 
major chord here. Um, but in 12, those sizes analogously don't add up. So 5 thirteenths uh, plus 3 thirteenths minus 8 thirteenths. Let's think about that figure a little bit. So analogously, that's 5 twelfths plus 3 twelfths. But then you've crossed the octave for the 8 out of 13 size. So then you have to go down 7 twelfths. So basically, uh, 5 thirteenths plus 3 thirteenths minus 8 thirteenths is the same adjacently in 12 as going plus 5 twelfths plus 3 twelfths minus 7 twelfths. So that's why at the end here in the adjacent version, you can see that we have F, B flat, D flat, and then it goes down to G flat. So this would be a good example of when, like, we could use our executive subjective decision-making powers to say, oh, well, those two notes are really, really obviously the same in that tiny short figure. So I'm going to make an exception and break this adjacent interval chain for a little bit just so I can get this to line up. Here we go. So we can continue on and see that these adjacent step sizes cause more drift to happen. Um, look at that. It goes to pitch class 10 here. And then continuing on with the exact same figure, you can see that the pitch is steadily drifting down. And just like we talked about before, um, you can see that these pitches don't add up in the arpeggiations, which is why we don't get straight up triads. Now, if we interpret example B a little bit differently, we can also try starting on the tonic as C, and I think this is a little bit more convincing. Okay, and now here's our tonic version starting. We're treating C as the tonic now. So here, I'll show you. See how C is the tonic here? So now if we compare every note to C, that moment when the notes cross over the tritone analogously is now at a different spot. Okay, and now here's the adjacent version that I corrected. So, check this out. We talked about the Fs in the tonic version, but now in the adjacent version, what we do is we perform the exact same sequence where we analogize it by whatever interval happened before. But now when we get to this interval here, I'm going to put this little arrow here and I'm just going to arbitrarily say, okay, now I'm going to use, I'm going to put on my tonic glasses and I'm gonna interpret this next note as if it's coming from the tonic of F sharp um, so that we start and sort of end in the same place instead of continually drifting around based on whatever, whatever intervals have happened before. So I think this does a little bit better because then now we start at pitch class 10, major second below. I'm gonna do the same thing with this bar since it's drifted by then. So I'm just gonna say, okay, we're gonna start a major third below instead of wherever we would be in adjacent land. So then all of those intervals are there. And similarly with the very last bar, I'm just going to say, okay, we're just going to start, I guess, uh, three. Let's see. I guess a minor third above or major sixth below. So there we go. That's the adjacent version right there. I'm going to play that for you. It's too bad that last section ends up not being really very convincing at all. But yeah, okay. So now I've sort of gone over what it means to compare tonic and adjacent versions. So now when I talk about some examples, I won't be going over that as much. Okay, so some examples in my own music. Here's Console Empath, a song for four hands, 14 tone keyboard. I use the Godzilla 9 scale to make a middle, middle interval sound like either a perfect fourth or a major third if you were just rounding everything to 12 tone equal temperament using categorical perception. So here's the, the figure right here at the top, notated in 14.
Okay, so that makes sense, right? Um, and here's the tonic version. You can see that if we compare around the major sixth, there's two pitch classes uh, a fourteenth of an octave apart that are both the closest to the major sixth. So this tonic interpretation is very flawed. And then what happens with the adjacent version here is... Well, we get all the adjacent intervals to be correct, but look at the very ending interval. It turns out being a perfect fourth instead of a major third. And let me play this again. It's this note here. You hear how when I did that, both of those notes were the same? But now here in the adjacent version, they're different. We talked about the tonic version, the differences there, the brackets indicate that, and then the circles here indicate that we actually get to different notes at the end. So a major third goes in the same category as a perfect fifth in 14 tone equal temperament, which makes it xenharmonic through structural drift. These two destination notes that normally end up sounding different in 12 sound the same in 14. So that's the first example. So the second example here is um, from a song called Fiat Circadia, uh, one of my favorite songs that I've created. Um, the goal of the opening chord progression is to get the 0, 360, 720 cent triad, a cool neutral triad in 10 and 20, to sound either minor or augmented. So I will go ahead and talk about that and will chunk repetitive pieces of material as necessary. So here's that opening Fiat Circadia theme. Okay, so how do you hear that main triad, the one that's starting on E down there in the example? Um, well, here's what the tonic version gives us. It gives us a major triad because when you're comparing from E, which I've decided to be the tonic in the 12 EDO analogs, 360 is closer to a major third. So it's going to make that major in the tonic example, but in the adjacent example, uh, the idea that I have used a... A pitch class before it, like its major second, through a stack of fifths to approach that note makes it sound minor. So here's the tonic version. Okay, so that's the tonic version right there. Now let's play the adjacent version. Okay, so there we go. We got the tonic versions and the adjacent versions. Now, the thing that's a little bit crazy about the adjacent version here is that you see from bar two to bar three, we have a shift of 240 cents. But based on where I'd like us to hear that as a fourth bass progression, it doesn't register as shifting the entire structure down into to flat land, right? But adjacently, since B there goes up 240 cents in the 10 EDO example uh, to D down, we have to, in the adjacent version, go B, D flat, and then shift that entire structure. But maybe the A flat in that sounds more like the chord that comes from the 10 EDO example. It's all really fascinating stuff. So what I tried to do here with Fiat Circadia was uh, create an interpretation that will cause that triad to be minor and cause an interpretation that would make it augmented and put them at opposite ends of the progression so that you're not hearing those conflicts a lot, but once you're at the beginning, you get like, oh, this is kind of minor, and then at the end, it's oh, kind of augmented. Then when the cycle repeats, what you want thought, heh, what you once thought was augmented snaps back into minor, categorically. So it's very interesting. Um, so for the evidence that it's minor, while well, the 240 cent major second only goes up to an 120 cent minor second, right? Bum, 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 bum. If that happens, then that note's a minor third, right? That can only, that's the only way that happens in 12 EDO. Um, and then, of course, when the triad holds at the end, we've got a perfect fifth in it. But that first piece of evidence is really more important. Uh, the melodic figure establishes it as minor. 
and then the evidence that it's augmented, well, when you have that part that goes dum bum 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 ba, and then that cold ho cord holds, that's like a stack of two fourths going down, and then those very top two notes again. So f picture a major chord in a second inversion. When those two notes shift down by semitone, well, when that happens in twelve, you get an augmented chord, but in ten, you get this other chord instead. So. Uh, now here's a version uh, that uses the synth. I'll play the 10 EDO version again, and then what I want you to, to do is I want you to listen to the version where I combine both tonic and adjacent interpretations into one thing. Here's the analogous version. So see how those ending points are different in 12, but then in 10 they're not? That's what I was interested in. I even actually include it in the song itself at the end during a little montage, but I don't have time to play that. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is ho Holiday Time Party Edition. I had a similar goal in this one, uh, but instead of getting the 0, 360, 720 cent triad to sound, um, you know, either minor or augmented, I wanted it to uh, sound major or minor. So there are a few ways that I did this. Um, so in this analysis, the inner voices have um, interesting motions between each other, and that's important to establish the zenharmonic twist, because otherwise the roots themselves don't exhibit structural drift. So here's a good example of an analyzing something zenharmonically where the structural drift doesn't suggest that it's zenharmonic. Um, because if you look at this chord progression, uh, here's the, the guitar part. Neutral triad. Dominant seventh with a low seventh. Major. Dominant seventh with a higher seventh. Now, I dominant seventh with the high seventh again. So, you may have heard that when that second dominant seventh repeated back to the tonic, it sounded more minor, and when it repeated at the first ending, it sounded more major. So, that's very much done on purpose, because if you look in the, uh, the G7 chord, as shown in 12 tone equal temperament, when it's in 20, that F up goes up, to F double up in the D neutral chord. So in 12 tone equal temperament, you don't have a, a subdominant chord's seventh going up, and then that next chord is minor if it's the tonic. It's always major. So I'm providing different little clues within how the chords resolve. Um, so the oral evidence that uh, that first chord is major, well, let's talk about minor first. The 360 cent third goes up 1 20th of an octave to the super major third, the root of the next chord. That's something you might not really notice very much, actually, but maybe if we listen to it again, you will. Uh, in 12, of course, a minor third is the interval of semitone below a major third. Um, and then in the dominant chord that repeats back to the tonic chord at the second ending, the seventh of the chord is the 1020 cent size instead of the 960. So that means that when the seventh resolves down to the third of the tonic, it's resolving by 180 cents. So, like, if you've got a dominant seventh chord and that seventh resolves down a major second, the next chord is going to sound minor, right? Because of that step. But if the seventh were to resolve down a minor second, it would sound major. So if I had used the 960 cent seventh on the dominant chord in the second ending, we probably wouldn't have this effect where the first chord sounds minor once you snap back to it. Now I'm going to go over some examples in other people's music. So, uh, Abraccio de Fogato. I think I'm pronouncing that right, because I sang the song, and Lois said the Portuguese was okay. Uh, this is a song by Lois Lancaster. If you haven't heard it, it's it's really wonky and cool. It's like he's using uh, the Mavila 7 scale like the diatonic scale. Um, he uses a handful of compact and harmonic tunings in his music, such as Mavila 7, 
Blackwood 10, Orwell 9, and Bull and Pierce, uh, the famous non-octave tuning. Um, since this song uses Mavilla 7, it should be very zenharmonic, and it is, but through structural drift we don't have many interpretations of the pitches because of the quarter tone problem. 150 cents is between two 12 EDO ones, so this causes an interesting approximation issue. Now, this scale has diatonic triads, just like Mean Tone 7, and their qualities are listed below. It's got a 1, 2 augmented, 3 minor, 4 major, 5 major, 6 minor, and 7 minor. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So here's how the song goes in this first part, and look at the chord analysis as well. Oops, I have an extra note, that's okay. Okay, so that's how that goes. And then here's the, the synthesizer version I came up with. It has some chords that fulfill the roles of diatonic chords, but their intonations are wildly different. And this is really strange because check this out. In the tonic interpretation, we have notes that are on an exact quarter tone from the tonic, so we can't make a decision about whether they count as the higher version of the 12 EDO note or the lower version. It's right between our categories. It is exactly as out of slot as it could numerically be. So those occur here on the G down notes, analogously, and they also occur on the B flat down notes, which are right here. So I've decided to write those as G and B flat because the way things are already spelled in an analogous major scale, the five chord uses G and B flat. But some zenharmonic things happen. If you see that B flat in measure two, it actually creates a minor sixth above the root of the four chord in 16. So there's a good example of something little in zenharmonic that happens. So yeah. I just explained that. So, with the adjacent version here, check out what happens. Our adjacent version tells us the G down has to be a G since it's approached by major third. You see that very first part? Da 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 da. And which in 12 is more like da 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 da. Since that's approached by major third, well now, look, that's a major third. So we know that that has to be G. Um, if it was approached by minor third, it would be G flat. Um, but it's not. And then. Uh, it's still approached stepwise, uh, the B flat, by uh, A flats. So that doesn't tell us which one it should be. You see what I mean? Coming at an interval from different angles gives you more information about it. So yeah. Okay. So there are all those notes circled. The G's, and there's the B flats. Let me show you what the 12 video version sounds like. Quarter tones break this young theory. In this melodic portion, we had something playing in a completely zenharmonic scale, but the tonic and adjacent translations into 12 completely agree with each other. But certainly Mavilla has got a really zenharmonic flavor. Um, so harmony can hide small irregularities in categorical perception, and if we don't analyze intervals in all the ways that they compare to each other, we can miss the little things that I talked about where like, E going to F up is 220, or E flat going to F up is 225 cents. Or that in the four chord, the root is a minor sixth away from B flat down instead of a major sixth like it would normally be in 12 tet if we choose to call that B flat. Now this issue alone makes me think that there should be some kind of nuanced comparison where you actually account for an equal temperament and then two times the equal temperament in the case of a tie. Um, so that you're actually analyzing it in whatever your standard tuning is times two. Maybe that would help. Okay, our next example here is Love is the Catalyst by Elaine Walker, one of my favorite songs in 10 EDO. I've got a 10 EDO bias. So listen to this song here. I get the feeling when I read about the cosmos and ponder how things really work. Both beautiful thirds, right? The neutral triad in its entirety. That we are the eyes and ears of the universe. And that is our purpose. And love is the
Okay, so you've just heard the chorus in the verse. Duh. That's where our tonality is. Okay, so now let's skip to the part where um, we seem like we're ascending a normal scale, but then the intervals stretch way more than we thought they would. Unless you've heard this song before. Right here. <laughs> Okay, so what happened there? Let's talk about how that would go in 12 tet. So in 12 tet, we could ascend up by going da 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 and we would have where basically both of the figures are uh, a major second and a minor second adjacently going up. But if we do that in 10, we stretch all the way to a leading tone from the neutral third. But then in 12, if we start on the major third and do that, we only get to the minor seventh. So what I just referred to is actually the adjacent interpretation, where those intervals will only get us so far. And then in the tonic version, we have to create an uncomfortable break in that last measure, where we actually have to jump up an augmented second instead of the analogous major second. So here, let me show you the 10 EDO synth version, and then we'll talk about the tonic and adjacent versions. And part of the zen that comes from that leading tone, Elaine doesn't actually go up to that next note, but you hear that that note is so high that it can be a leading tone for a tonic chord. Um, at least I hear that. Maybe you don't. But anyway, here's the tonic 12 EDO version. It doesn't quite work, does it? Because in 10, all those triads are also neutral triads, so they all have the same quality. But in 12, we have to either get a stick a weird augmented triad in there, or we have to actually change our neutral third from major to minor, depending on local phenomena. And that changes what we have to do in the adjacent version. You see that we have implied E flat major and then G flat major happening instead. So here's the adjacent rendering. different third, so it doesn't work. See how different that is? So yeah, anyway, that's just some really interesting stuff about Love is the Catalyst. I've always liked that little moment in the song. I thought it would be really cool to compare the chords. Okay, I don't really have time to go over this one very much, but I have a video on my YouTube channel about it, which you should definitely watch. Um, it's about the movement of Easley Blackwood's microtonal etude that's in 15 tone equal temperament, where he uses uh, the Blackwood 10 triads and scale. So this is actually just a prime example of Blackwood temperament, and in the video on my channel, I combined the tonic and adjacent approaches because I hadn't really figured out that vocabulary yet, but with the tonic approach, if we're comparing everything to D, our analogous 12 tone note, we get uh, points between A minor and C minor, as well as E minor and G minor, where we have a minor third instead of a 240 cent step so that everything can stay in the same key. And then in the adjacent version, we have, well, the fact that the uh, 240 cent step is analogous to a major second and 15 tone equal temperament means that the pitch continues to drop. So yeah, here's the YouTube video. I highly recommend you check it out if you'd like to hear those. Okay, and then our last uh, example here is couples therapy, which is in 22. I thought I should do one analysis where the standard tuning isn't 12, um, and the Zen harmonic tuning is still uh, Zen harmonic tuning. So 22 EDO uses the porcupine scale, which we've been talking about at Parnu, um, and it's really, really simple. So hopefully this will make sense. Uh, so here's how the song sounds if you haven't heard it. Just one. And now here's the part I'm referring to, the bass line. There's no more on notes in your body, there's no more on notes in your body. 
Right? Porcupine scale going down. It's a half step. And then that little one step is just in bar four at the end. Da 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 da. Right? This song is so fun. I love that timbre and the piano and the song there. But um, anyway, uh, all of those notes, you know, just the implied roots every two scale degrees of the porcupine scale, it uses the parallel major chords from that. So then when Jacob Barton introduces the new element of having sort of the root of the chord appear in a high voice and then slink around microtonally, it doesn't work in 12 or in 19. So let me show you how the bass line sounds in 19 if we use a tonic approach. Uh, if we compare each note to the tonic, we have sort of different steps, really, and we actually have a diatonic scale. Ah, oh, that really that really doesn't sound like it works. Like that B doesn't divide the G sharp like it should, and then the E sounds way too low. It just doesn't work. Now, here's a scale that's really interesting, where we take the whole step of 19, which is closest to the porcupine step of 22, and we just iterate that over and over, since we've got a descending stepwise bass line, and we actually would get a major second too low in 19. But if we start the cycle over, it just looks like we kind of dropped a note. So I'll show you that. It goes like this. Pretty crazy, right? Okay, and then as a last little touch, I'll show you, I'll kind of sing the voices that go with the parallel major chords here. So imagine that uh, your chords here for the first bar would be like D, and then for the second bar, 22 EDO, would be like B down is a major chord, and then G up is a major chord, and then uh, E is a major chord. So um, you can imagine that if a voice were to stay, you know, in a D-like area, what happens here is you'd start on D, and then you go to D sharp down, right? Or D sharp double down, because it's the real major third. So that just slinks up a little bit. And then you would go to D up, because that's the fifth of a G up chord. And then that last one, oh, I'm not actually sure what it is. Let's check. Oh, I'm gonna skip to the part where he adds it. So here's the idea. The idea is that the, the those little high notes that are microtonally shifting that he adds later, it would be a D in that first one, right? Because D is the root. And then D sharp double down for a B down major chord. And then for a G up major chord, you'd have D up. And then for that E chord, I believe, I'm not sure if it's a harmonic seventh or not. I think it is. Um, that would be just D down, right? And then D down just slinks right up to D. So that note has four different intonations. And if you were to try that in 19, it wouldn't work. So yeah, anyway. That's the last analysis. I hope you had fun with this presentation. I had fun going through different songs and trying to analogize them to a standard tuning from a Zen harmonic tuning. Well, anyway, thanks very much for having me for this presentation. Uh, and now I look forward to the discussion. Uh, you can find me on YouTube, Patreon, SoundCloud, and Bandcamp. Bye-bye.